History has it that Alexander the Great was the most powerful man on earth in the 300 BCs. Even after his death, he was revered by kings of other territories and by extension their people. In fact, to some, he was considered a god. Due to his godlike status, Alexander's treasures and remains were hoarded by his admirers. People fought over the possession of the warrior's remains. His tomb, which had become a popular tourist attraction, was looted quite often. Many of his valuable possessions were either stolen or destroyed. One of Alexander's most valued possessions, which was also lost, was his signet ring. In this video, we'll take a journey through history and explore how Alexander's famous signet ring was passed down a long list of people and the efforts of archaeologists to retrieve it. In the olden times, the great kings had different objects that were physical representations of their great power. Although the king's power was etched into everything he owned, some of the king's properties were more significant than others. Alexander the Great had a signet ring with which he ruled over his vast kingdom. The band of this ring was crafted using pure gold and at its head there was a huge red sapphire crystal on which the portrait of the great warrior was imprinted. The warrior's famous signet ring was one of the greatest symbols of his power and it was hugely coveted by rulers of other territories as well as members of Alexander's court. Upon his death, the young warrior's ring traveled the world for more than 100 years and was lost in transit. The search for this historical treasure has gone on for many years, and archaeologists may finally have something worthwhile to say about the long-lasting search. The story of the search for this ring includes several elements, including betrayal and murder. But let's look at the story from the beginning. A quick introduction to who Alexander was would help you understand why the very long search for his signet ring is so important to practically every civilization to exist after his death. Alexander III of Macedon was a king of the ancient Greek kingdom of Macedon. His father Philip II was murdered at a royal event and shortly after his demise, Alexander succeeded. He was just 20 years old when he ascended the throne, and for most of his time as king, he conducted lengthy military campaigns all over the world conquering cities, killing their rulers, and expanding his territory. By the time he was 30, he had created the largest empire in the world at the same time, spanning from Greece to the end of Asia. He fought many battles, but he never suffered defeat. He was considered a god in the eyes of his people and others. After he conquered a new territory, he would take on the title of the ruler of said territory. Thus, he was a man of many titles. Apart from being king of Macedon, he was pharaoh of Egypt, king of Persia, and lord of Asia. Although he had a very prosperous reign, Alexander's reign was short. After being king for a little over 12 years, Alexander's life was cut short at the young age of 32. At the time of his death in 323 BC, the great warrior was in Babylon. He suffered from a fever for a few days without any signs of improvement, despite the efforts of the most skilled Babylonian physicians. As the days went by, his condition worsened and he couldn't speak. Sadly, he passed a few days later. Although the actual case of his death remains unknown, some historical accounts claim that he was poisoned. Others claim that Alexander's fever resulted from one of the prevalent illnesses in ancient Babylon, like typhoid or malaria. The death of Alexander threw his kingdom into chaos and disarray, mostly because he did not appoint any successor, and his only heir, Alexander IV, was born later that year. While the leaders of Macedonia were arguing about Alexander's succession plans, Perdiccas, the highest-ranking Babylonian official, had a plan. Perdiccas was one of Alexander's most loyal followers and a trusted military commander. Apart from their military ties, Perdiccas and Alexander go way back as they were childhood friends. They were both educated at the Temple of the Nymphs at Maeza, a school for nobles. Under the tutelage of Greek philosopher Aristotle, they learned science, arts, and literature. For most of his life, Perdiccas fought side by side with Alexander and believed in the world he was trying to create. To uphold the kingdom that Alexander had spent 12 years trying to build, Perdiccas decided that he was the most suited successor to Alexander. After Alexander's death, Perdiccas stepped up and became regent for Philip III, Alexander's intellectually disabled half-brother, and Alexander IV, 
Alexander's infant child. He also became custodian of the treasury and supreme commander of the royal army. His succession plan was met with much resistance by other Macedonian nobles and commanders. However, unknown to them, Perdiccas had already acquired a triumphant card. He had Alexander's signet ring. When his opposition saw that he had Alexander's backing, they withheld their opinions and made an offer with Perdiccas. This offer afforded the various commanders a small territory out of the vast empire they had helped Alexander build. With the king's signet ring in his hand, Perdiccas ruled over what was left of the Macedonian Empire, keeping the rest of the kingdom intact. This part of the story is where the Battle of Alexander's Admirers begins. Due to the chaos that Alexander's death created throughout the kingdom, Macedonians forgot about making funeral plans for their deceased king. However, when Perdiccas took control, he started making grand burial plans for Alexander. First, he ordered that the king's remains be embalmed, and he spent the next two years of his reign planning a grand funeral fit for a king. Contrary to Alexander's wish to be buried in the temple of Zeus Ammon in Siwa Oasis, Perdiccas decided to send his remains to Aegea in Macedonia, where kings are buried. Perdiccas personally oversaw the construction of a golden carriage that Alexander's remains would be transported in. It was so big it required 64 mules to tow. Before long, the carriage containing Alexander and his treasures, including the ring, set out for Macedonia along with a great military company. All the way in Egypt, the ruler, who was an old friend, former general and avid admirer of Alexander, caught wind of Perdiccas's plan and decided to intercept the journey. Alexander spent a very long time in Egypt when he was still alive. In fact, one of the largest cities in Egypt, Alexandria, was named after him. So, based on their history, Ptolemy I decided that Egypt was a better resting place for Alexander. Apart from his sentiments towards Alexander, Ptolemy I and Perdiccas had a long-lasting rivalry. This rivalry had started before Ptolemy was sent to Egypt by Alexander after he conquered it. Now that they were both rulers of the most powerful territories in their times, they were naturally enemies. The possession of Alexander's remains made Perdiccas look powerful for two years, and Ptolemy was jealous. So, he made plans to secure the remains of Alexander and gain the power that comes with it. He intercepted the transport of the carriage at Syria, bribed the escort, seized the carriage, and took everything in it with him to Memphis, Egypt. When Perdiccas heard about this turn of events, he was furious. In the heat of his rage, he marched to Egypt. His plan was to invade Egypt, defeat Ptolemy, and seize his territory and treasury. This way, he could settle the long-lasting rivalry and restore his power. Unfortunately for Perdiccas, Ptolemy had the home advantage and greater battle strength, as most of Perdiccas' men had lost their lives in three failed attempts to cross the Nile. Perdiccas lost the battle before it began, and he died at Ptolemy's hand. As far as we know, Ptolemy had no interest whatsoever in the treasures of Alexander. He talked more about acquiring his signet ring for himself. He only wished to give a man whom he considered a god an elaborate Egyptian funeral. After acquiring Alexander's remains and treasures, Ptolemy I built an elaborate tomb for Alexander in Memphis. Ancient Egyptians held nothing back when it came to the funerals of their pharaohs whom they considered next to gods. Ptolemy I was the pharaoh the Egyptians recognized, but Alexander was his superior. So imagine how grand this tomb was. A few hundred years later, Ptolemy IV was convinced he could build a much bigger tomb for Alexander the Great. He moved the capital of Egypt from Memphis to Alexandria, and there he built the most elaborate burial complex in his honor. The tomb was grand and rich in splendor. All the warrior's treasures were on display in the tomb. People from other parts of the world came in their numbers to experience the magnificence of this burial chamber. The exposure of this tomb and its contents led to frequent looting as people would come in to take whatever item caught their attention. In his days, Alexander built and oversaw the largest empire in the world. However, there were some countries he did not invade during his conquest. Rome was one such city. In fact, one of the biggest questions in history was who would emerge victorious if Rome and Macedonia had met in battle. 
To ambitious Romans, Alexander was a man who had attained the status they desired. He was a man worthy of their respect and emulation. Throughout the Ptolemaic dynasty, Roman leaders Julius Caesar, Augustus, Titus, Caligula, Hadrian, and Vespasian, on different accounts, visited the tomb of Alexander in the Soma to pay their respects. In about 30 BC, Octavian, formerly referred to as Augustus Caesar, conquered the Egyptian Empire after its leader Cleopatra died. After the battle had settled and Egypt was now under the newly established Roman Empire, Octavian frequently visited the tomb of Alexander. When he entered the tomb, Octavian viewed the displayed body of Alexander. To pay his respects, he placed a garland of flowers on the tomb and a golden crown on Alexander's head. He was not satisfied with that, and he proceeded to run his hands along his mummified body, leading to the tip of his nose falling off. It is unknown whether Alexander's golden signet ring caught his eye on that visit or on subsequent visits to the tomb. Octavian took possession of the golden ring and altered it, replacing Alexander's portrait with his. He wore the ring for years until one night, according to Roman history, Alexander appeared to him in a dream, cursing him and calling him a thief. After Octavian's death, the next Roman emperor, Tiberius, kept the ring and used it to impress his picture on sealing wax. In 37 AD, Caligula gained possession of the ring after he assassinated Tiberius. The ring was passed from hand to hand and it's unknown what happened to it after Tiberius. Some historical accounts claim that Claudius, another Roman emperor, kept the ring and secretly gave it to his son Britannicus. The last mention of Alexander's signet ring was in 215 AD, when Caracalla restored some of Alexander's lost treasures. According to chronicler John of Antioch, Caracalla returned Alexander's tunic, belt, and other precious items, including the long-lost signet ring, and placed them on the coffin. As the search for this lost signet ring continues, some archaeologists believe that the ring still sits in Alexander's tomb, which has been lost for many centuries. Others believe it was part of the treasures that were looted and destroyed by the early Roman Christians. Was Alexander the Great's treasures sold to the highest bidder? Comment below where you think his ring is. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe if you want to learn more about history on Crunch. Thanks for watching.